So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, it's Rebecca Bowler from the University of Oxford. And Rebecca won the Winton A Prize, and she's going to talk for, on the search for luminous star-forming galaxies at ultra-high redshift. So very relevant to the talk we've just heard. Rebecca. Perfect. So thank you very much. So my name is Rebecca Bowler, and I'm a research fellow at the University of Oxford. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, to talk to you today about my research. I'm delighted to be here, and I was uh, delighted to receive the prize as well. So thank you very much. Uh, I also wanted to thank you for giving me the kind of once-in-a-career opportunity to give a talk following uh, Martin Rees. So big <laughs> shoes to fill, so I'll do my best. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about galaxies at ultra-high redshifts. And hopefully, at the end of, end of this talk, you're going to see an image. Oops, sorry, turn this on. You're going to see an image like this, essentially a blob, and be like, wow, that's really fascinating. So that's my goal, OK? <laughs> that's my goal. You can tell me in the drinks afterwards if I succeeded. OK, so what do I mean by ultra-high redshift? So I'm talking about the first billion years in the universe. I'm talking about the very limits of what we can see with telescopes today. So these are galaxies at redshift 7 and above. So in this nice schematic of the universe, the history of the universe, uh, on the right here you can see the Big Bang. After the Big Bang, we have a, a relatively boring period called the Cosmic Dark Ages. And here, nothing much was happening except for structure formation. So we had a simulation in the previous talk showing you um, the act action of gravity forming um, the first kind of structures. And it's in these structures that the first galaxies formed. And this is thought to happen a few hundred million years after the Big Bang. And what's really remarkable is now we can actually observe some of these galaxies. So on this lovely plot, you can see some uh, objects highlighted and some redshifts. So now the redshift record uh, is redshift 11. So this is a galaxy um, that's, that's been observed at redshift 11, which is really remarkable, uh, by the Hubble Space Telescope. And really, we're now um, able to, to well probe this epoch, which is called the reionization era, one billion years after the Big Bang. And this is um, a crucial era in that it's when we have the first stars and galaxies forming, we have the first supermassive black holes forming and impacting their host galaxies, and we have the first um, uh, dust uh, molecules and particles forming in this epoch. Uh, the process of reionization as well is a fundamental change in the state of the universe where it became uh, ionized for the first time. Okay, so in my talk I'm going to uh, kind of illustrate um, some of the amazing things we can do in this epoch with observations. So how do we probe this high redshift universe? What objects can we find in this epoch? So there's several different probes. Uh, one of the most exciting, I think, is, is quasars. So these are extremely luminous objects, which helps you to find them at very great distances. And this is a, a lovely spectrum of a, a redshift 7 quasar, so uh, one, one billion years after the Big Bang. In addition to quasars, we've also found some very extreme galaxies at this epoch. So um, these are called submillimeter galaxies, and these are essentially incredibly dusty starburst galaxies. So they're forming thousands of solar masses per year, um, and it's heavily dust-obscured. And so that's what this plot is showing you. It's a, um, a galaxy at redshift 6 or so, uh, and what you can see here is a black body spectrum. So this is the emission from the dust. It's basically the heat emission from the dust, and that's how this object was detected. And there's also gamma ray bursts. So gamma ray bursts give us a kind of, um, uh, they highlight galaxies that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to see. Be able to see. Um, and this enables you to, to study faint galaxies at very, very high redshifts. Uh, and essentially what you're seeing here is the afterglow. So the gamma ray burst goes off in the galaxy, and what you can, what you can observe is the afterglow of this energetic uh, process. So the three uh, kind of, objects I've shown you so far, these are all quite extreme um, and rare, very, very rare processes. But what I'm going to talk to you today is uh, the more normal galaxies. So these are the, the kind of uh, typical objects at this epoch. But these are really fun fundamental as they then grow into all of the galaxies that we see today. OK, so how do we find these very, very distant galaxies? Well, you've already seen this image uh, today. So this is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It's a really um, incredible achievement. Uh, this is a um, Hubble Space Telescope image that covers a tiny fraction of the sky, as I'll show you in a second. But basically everything you can see in this image is a galaxy. 
And the galaxies that I'm interested, interested in are the very reddest objects, and they're, and they're very small, compact, faint things in this image. So this is an amazing achievement, but the Hubble Space Telescope and this image is limited in what it can do. And that is due to the fact that Hubble has a very tiny field of view. So it only probes a very tiny volume. And this means that if we have some sort of rare, massive galaxy at these early times, the probability of finding it in this tiny image is very low. So to uncover the full galaxy population, what we need to do is combine data um, over different volumes together and probe larger volumes. So if you take this image now, and I'm going to show you the same image, but in scale to the moon, OK? So on this diagram, that is the image I just showed you. So this Hubble Ultra Deep Field shows you how tiny this patch is, um, but still it's full of millions of galaxies, which is amazing. But really, if we want to probe kind of more massive galaxies and understand the full galaxy population, we must use wider area data. So that's what I've shown here. Um, this, these red kind of rectangles are the best that Hubble can do. So Hubble tried to, to give us a wider area, uh, and they did fantastically. Um, and this is what we can do using ground-based telescopes. So with ground-based telescopes, it's, you're able to make larger images and hence find these uh, rarer galaxies. So how do we select them? How do we find these objects? So this is a little movie that's going to show, uh, that's going to illustrate how we, how we select these very distant galaxies. So what you can see here is a wavelength along the bottom, and all of these coloured curves are the filters that are on the Hubble Space Telescope. So they go from um, uh, the optical range here, so essentially red, green, blue filters, into the near-infrared, so beyond what we can see. And the, the little pictures here are showing you what Hubble would see through each one of these filters. The grey the gray spectrum here is a simulated spectrum of a distant galaxy. At the moment it's at redshift 3, but it's going to redshift to higher and higher redshifts, and we're going to see how it would appear to Hubble. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> there we go. Okay, right, so I'll just play this now. Um, here we go. I'll play it again. Okay, right. So just to, to play that again. So what you can see here is what's called the Lyman break. And this is essentially how we, just, we select these galaxies. And as you can, you can see, is when this object redshifts, it becomes invisible in certain bands on the blue side, and on the red side, it's visible. So we use this fact to select these galaxies, and we use the position of this break to give you an approximate redshift, or photometric redshift. Um, so this Lyman break uh, is kind of intrinsic to the galaxy. So it's due to the fact that if a photon has higher energy than this, it will be absorbed by neutral hydrogen. And so we use this to select very high redshift galaxies. And just one interesting note, so you see the, the, the video stopped at redshift 12. So if you went to higher redshift than this, the object would be invisible to Hubble. So you could spend as many hours as you want staring at the sky, and you would never find anything above redshift 12 with Hubble. And this is why astronomers are so excited about the James Webb Space Telescope, because James Webb is going to go redder than Hubble can reach now and find uh, even more distant galaxies. Right. OK, so this is how we find these very distant objects in deep imaging data. So what, uh, what I've been doing and others have been doing is using these wide area surveys to find samples of bright, rare galaxies at these early times. And I'll tell you why that's important in a second. But first, I wanted to show you what we found. OK, so we searched these large images I showed you for uh, high redshift galaxies. We weren't expecting to find very many. We were expecting to find uh, maybe one or two, um, but we found quite a few. So in fact, we found 10, which I'll explain in a second. But I just wanted to show you this slide before I go on, um, which I like showing at, at colloquia and seminars as well. Because if you, if you think about distant galaxies, one of the things I think about is some beautiful image or an artist's impression, but I wanted to show you this actual the reality. Actually, the reality is this. So this is a, this is a high redshift galaxy. So it's a blob. Here's another one. Uh, and here's another one. So these are the inspiring galaxy images I wanted to show you. Does it keep doing that? It keeps doing that. But, okay, I'll just keep going. 
Um, so these are, these are four galaxies that we found in this data. And the images are, so that each galaxy is along here. And the images are just like I showed you in the movie. So we go from blue wavelengths to red wavelengths. And you can see the object is invisible here. Uh, ignore that column, sorry, here, but visible um, in, the, in the redder wavelengths. And this is how we can tell that it's a high redshift galaxy. Okay. So why do we want to understand the full population of galaxies? Why can't we just look at the very faintest galaxies in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field and be happy with that? Why do we want to find these brighter galaxies using other data? Well, it's to really understand the astrophysics of galaxy formation at early times. And so this is a really nice uh, sketch, which I'm going to describe to you now. So um, this is showing a luminosity function. So essentially, it's the number density of galaxies as a function of luminosity. That's all it is. So uh, the y-axis number density, and this is the galaxy luminosity. Now, if you take uh, dark matter, you take simulations of the inner universe, which only have dark matter in them, and you populate this dark matter with galaxies, with some very simple translation. So say, you know, if you have, if you have some dark matter and then you put 10% baryons in that dark matter halo, what would your galaxy look like? What you get is the red curve here. So this is the theoretical prediction for how many galaxy, galaxies we should find at each luminosity. But what's actually found is quite different. So what's actually found is shown in, in the blue curve here. So you can see that the observations are deviating from what's predicted by the simulations. So they're deviating at the faint end, so there are fewer fainter galaxies than predicted, and at the bright end as well. So we don't see these very, very bright galaxies uh, that are predicted by just purely the dark matter. And so astronomers want to understand why this is. And so it's postulated that the reason for this is due to various types of feedback. So it's galaxies uh, feeding back and, and stopping more stars from forming. So they're being quenched. Their, their star formation is being halted, so they don't grow as large. So for faint galaxies, this is thought to be due to supernova feedback. So if you have a very small faint galaxy, if a few supernova go off, this has a big impact on the galaxy. And essentially, it stops the star formation, meaning that you see fewer, <coughs> fewer of these objects. For very bright galaxies or very massive galaxies, supernova go off, but they don't have such an effect because the galaxy is so massive it can hold on to all of its fuel. It falls back in. And instead, what's thought to be stopping these extremely massive or luminous galaxies forming is feedback from active black holes. So it's thought that the supermassive black holes in the centre of these massive galaxies uh, stop the stars forming in that galaxy. So the jets coming out, the energy that the black hole puts into the galaxy quenches star formation and stops the star formation in this galaxy. So this is the theory. And this is really interesting for a high redshift astronomer like me, because if you look to very, very high redshifts, you could, you could get to the situation where the black holes are not massive enough or they're not efficient enough at, at, at doing this. And so you might expect that at very high redshifts, you'd see something that looks more like the dark matter prediction from theory. So now I'm going to show you the observations that we have at this very early time. So this is redshift 7, so one, uh, well, 800 million years after the Big Bang or so. Uh, and again, it's exactly the same plot, so the number density of galaxies. Um, because we're astronomers, everything is backwards and in magnitudes, so luminosity is now going to the left. So you can see uh, this kind of shape that was shown with the blue curve. Uh, and all of these data points here were, were taken from observations with the Hubble Space Telescope. So what you can see is that as you go to more luminous galaxies, the observations just stop. And this is because, as I said, the area covered by these tiny HST surveys is not, not big enough. So this was the case a few years ago. What we did was we analysed this wider area data, um, searching for these galaxies, these luminous galaxies. And we found some. So we weren't expecting to find very many. So this was the best fit to the the previous best fit to the data. Uh, it exponentially declines the number density here in this fit. So we, prediction from this fit was we'd find maybe one galaxy in the survey, but we found 10. So this was really exciting and it enabled us to put this very rough estimate of the number density of these very luminous galaxies on this plot. 
So it was, there was some tension with the previous results, um, but it was still consistent at this, at this stage. So a few years later, we got even deeper data over these fields, which enabled us to do another um, more thorough search. And we found even more galaxies, which was really exciting. Uh, so we confirmed the ones we already found, and we found some more, which enabled us to really build up the shape of the luminosity function uh, at the bright end for the first time. And in fact, what we found was that at this epoch, the number density of galaxies, the decline here of bright galaxies, doesn't appear to follow the exponential decline found at later times, and instead is more consistent with a kind of power law type thing, which again is similar to, to the underlying dark matter distribution. Now, I told you that we found more galaxies than we were expecting. So any scientist, when they find more than they expect, goes back and double checks what they found. So there are a few things we wanted to check before we really um, dug into the implications of this result. So the first was contamination. So I haven't really gone into this, but the selection of these galaxies is challenging. They're very distant. Um, they're faint in the data. Um, and occasionally, you, you get confusion with galaxies at different redshifts. So at lower redshifts, or even uh, get, uh, stars in our own galaxy can be confused with these objects observed just in these coarse filters. So one of the things we wanted to check was, um, are some of these objects actually not galaxies, but are they quasars? So this is motivated as well by a previous result at lower redshift. Here we go. So this, again, is the same plot. At redshift 3, what they found, they found also found an excess of bright things. But when they plotted what they expected from the quasars with this straight line here, they found that that entirely explained their excess. So actually, they weren't finding an excess of galaxies. They were just finding quasars in their galaxy search. So is this the case for our redshift 7 objects? So there are not many redshift 7 quasars known. In fact, I think there were four. I don't know if that's changed now, but there are very few. It's, it's less than 10. Uh, and so predicting the number of quasars at this epoch is incredibly difficult. So what we did was we extrapolated from low redshift. Um, so the black line is the one you should look at. So this was what we expect the redshift 7 quasar luminosity function to look like. And you can see that it's very much lower than our observed galaxy points. So we can exclude quasars as being contaminants in our, in our um, galaxy samples. So that's reassuring. The other thing that was a worry um, was gravitational lensing. So if you look at the number density of distant galaxies in a field where there's a very massive cluster at lower redshift, what happens is these background galaxies get lensed, and that causes them to appear more luminous than they actually are. And that then changes the shape that you get from the luminosity function. So that's what's shown here. So this, this is a luminosity function again, um, uh, but measured in a cluster field. So there's a massive foreground cluster here. And what they found was uh, something more like the blue curve. So they found an excess as well. But this is not a true excess. These galaxies are just intrinsically fainter than they appear. So we went to check whether this was a problem in our, in our, um, for, our, for our sample. And we found that there are no massive clusters, so we don't have to worry too much about very strong lensing. But what we do have is uh, moderate lensing, I'm calling it. So this is when our high redshift galaxy here is close to a foreground galaxy along the line of sight. And this foreground galaxy causes some magnification of this background source. But we found that this was not significant to change our results. But we were reassured to check this. OK. So now that we're confident in our luminosity function determination that these are real galaxies and we have a real excess, what does this mean? What are the astrophysical implications for this? So going back to this diagram again, where we have the prediction from theory as the red curve and the observations typically at low redshift, what we find is if we compare our observations with essentially this red curve, so the theory, so the, sorry, the black solid curve on this diagram, is the red curve on that diagram. I've just scaled it to match. What we find is our observations are in very good agreement with what's predicted by the simulations if there wasn't any feedback from active galaxies at this time. So this is really exciting. It's hinting that perhaps we're seeing an epoch before 
uh, quasar feedback, AGM feedback has become uh, efficient. Okay, so just in the last five minutes or so, I wanted to give you a little bit more of an insight into what these galaxies are like. So I've spoken a lot about the luminosity function, which is essentially the number of these galaxies. But now I want to go very, very briefly into uh, the, the other properties of these objects and what we can learn about galaxies one billion years after the Big Bang. So what's fantastic about these objects, even though they don't look particularly remarkable, is that they are extremely luminous. So I showed you the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. If you find a high redshift galaxy in that field and try and follow it up with um, you know, even a, well, some of the best telescopes in the world, you can spend 20, 50 hours staring at one galaxy and not see anything. These are very, very faint objects. So that's what's fantastic about this sample is that they're very bright. So it means that um, in relatively modest times, you can get some really interesting insights into their properties with these facilities. So why am I showing you these three pictures? Well, this is kind of illustrating what we can learn about these objects at high redshift. So I said I used ground-based data to find these galaxies. And ground-based data is fantastic for giving you a large image, but it's from the ground. So you don't have the exquisite resolution that you get from space telescopes. So if you follow up these galaxies with Hubble, this gives you the high resolution you need to understand their morphologies and their sizes. This image here is of the ALMA, so Atacama Large uh, Millimeter Array, and this is a, a submillimeter millimeter telescope. So this gives you uh, a completely different view of the galaxies and instead looks at the, at the dust rather than the starlight. And finally, on the right here, I'm showing you um, uh, the VLTs in Chile, and these are um, optical and near-infrared telescopes that can give you spectroscopy of the galaxies. So I, all I've, everything I've shown you so far has been photometry, so measured in very broad filters. If you want more detail, you need to go to, to spectroscopy. And these can give you all sorts of uh, interesting emission lines and so on. So I just have a few minutes, so I'm just going to show you the highlights of what we found. So we used these three facilities to look at these very bright galaxies. Uh, so I just want to show you, sorry. This, so I apologize for the color scheme here. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, <laughs> But there we go. Uh, oops. So um, what you can see here is Hubble Space Telescope images of essentially those blobs I showed you before. So in the ground-based data, they're just blobs. They're unresolved. But with Hubble, you can start to resolve the features in these galaxies. And this is really, really interesting. So this, uh, this kind of montage shows you the brightest galaxies in our sample. And you can see that they, a lot of them, particularly the very brightest ones here, all appear to be clumpy, merging galaxies at this, uh, at this epoch. So this is really exciting, uh, and I think it's really, really um, incredible, actually, that we're able to resolve structures in a galaxy <coughs> that's 13 billion light years away. Okay, so, uh, and in my last uh, two minutes, I just wanted to show you some exciting results from ALMA. So ALMA is an absolutely amazing um, telescope, as I said, looking at uh, the millimetre wavelengths. Uh, and just to illustrate what that gives you, this is... Um, kind of spectrum of your galaxy. And all of the results I've telling you so far is from photometry here. So this is an optical near infrared part of the spectrum. ALMA gives you this part. So this is the emission from the dust. So it's a completely different uh, aspect of the galaxy and really exciting to probe uh, whether dust was even there at these very early times. And so um, we observed these galaxies with 10 minutes of ALMA time. So we, we looked at each galaxy for 10 minutes uh, and we managed to detect dust in one of them. So this, again, is really remarkable. So this image here, the background is the Hubble image. So this is the starlight, and the white contours are the ALMA detections. This is the dust. So you can actually see here uh, dust in the first billion years, which is very cool. OK. So I'm just going to wrap up there. So hopefully I've convinced you that this is exciting, and that using ground-based data is a fantastic way to reveal the very brightest galaxies at these redshifts. These galaxies give you an astrophysical insight into the feedback processes from, from active black holes at this time, and we found more than expected from previous studies. And this suggests that there's a lack of quenching, perhaps, 
black hole feedback is not efficient at these early times. With detailed follow-up of these very bright galaxies, it's, it's possible to gain a unique insight into the physical properties of galaxies at these very early times. And we find with Hubble Space Telescope imaging that these objects look like merging objects or perhaps clumpy disks. And we also find significant dust already uh, in these early galaxies. And I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Rebecca, thank you very much indeed. That was a lovely talk. Uh, open for questions or comments. Ah, well, uh, yeah. <laughs> down here to Monica first. Thank you. Hi. Um, the, the dust that you're talking about in yes. these early galaxies, is there enough to form planets? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know what enough to form a planet is. I'm very much a galaxies person, but I, I mean, there's, there's plenty of dust, so yeah. Um, I guess the question is whether, whether planets can form in such a turbulent environment, because these are very early galaxies, so, so they're not static disks with not much happening. They're constantly merging and, and uh, gas is falling in, um, and the stars that are forming in these galaxies are... Um, producing a lot of high-energy photons and light, and this can really impact the, um, the dust. So. so, I mean, you, you talked about supernovae, yeah. uh, supernovae going off. I mean, how many sort of cycles as a, have stars been through in these galaxies to, to produce all the, the heavier elements and, and stuff? I mean, is it all That's there? Uh, another great question. I mean, so, so it's thought that the first generation of stars, so these are the... Uh, pristine stars that formed after the Dark Ages, these have very, very rapid lives. So they explode a supernova uh, within a few million years. And then in that explosion, they are then enriching the environment. So really, it's thought that this pristine period was very, very short. And, and so quite rapidly, we, we form um, kind of the chemical composition that we've been more used to locally. Down here, yep. Well, just sort of following on, and my original question follows on neatly from that one, and that is, any sign of these population three stars? Oh, brilliant. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's been several claims uh, for population three signatures in these, in these high rate of galaxies. I mean, one of the problems, as I said, is that you can spend a long time staring at these things and really not get very much back um, in terms of information. So there, there's, there was a detection recently of... Um, helium-2 emission, and so this is important because you have to have um, incredibly high-energy photons to excite this transition, and it's thought that only population three stars can give you that transition. So there was an observation of it, um, but then another team reanalyzed the data and the line disappeared. So this kind of shows you how hard it is to do this. Um, so, I, so I say not yet, but especially with James Webb, um, yeah, high hopes. Yes. Rebecca, thank you very much indeed for an excellent talk. Thank you. Thank you.